What's up guys and welcome to One Take. I'm Gil and today we're talking about Dark, Season 3, Episode 5, titled Life and Death. This video will of course have spoilers through Episode 5, but I haven't watched any of Season 3 beyond that episode, so no spoilers for Episode 6 onward. Before we jump into it, just a quick reminder if you haven't done so already, to hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, and of course the bell icon so you get notified the next time we do a video. Jumping into the episode, overall another great episode, everything continues to be top notch, but I do think it was probably the hardest episode to watch of Dark so far, just in terms of the absolute brutality we saw. It was shocking at the end of the episode to see Jonas die, of course. But Peter Doppler being killed it turned my stomach even more because this episode, more than any of the previous ones, got really up close and personal with character deaths in a way that I don't think we've seen before. And that created a really visceral reaction for me that made this a really tough episode to watch. But with that, let's get into the recap itself. We only spend a little bit of time in the alternate world, so let's start with that story and then take it year by year, character by character. So, in the alternate world, 2019, Charlotte meets with Alexander Tiedemann as part of their investigation into the dead boy that was found in the bunker. We, of course, know that that dead boy is Mads Nielsen. She questions Alexander about when he first came to Winden, when he started working at the nuclear plant, and then gets to the real question. She wants the shift schedules from 1986. She doesn't say it, but what she's looking for is to see when Helga was working and see if it's possible Helga had something to do with Ulrich's brother Mads' disappearance. I loved the unspoken tension in this scene between Alexander and Charlotte. First, the camera keeps cutting to that bag on Alexander's table, which we know is the bag that tells him Hannah has his passport, his gun, and she's threatening to blackmail him to destroy Charlotte's life. So we see that, and that creates tension for us. And then when Charlotte questions Alexander about his past, you can see him kind of shift uncomfortably in his chair. And that subtle movement just adds to the tension in that scene. Charlotte returns home and sees Elizabeth didn't go to school that day. I'm assuming she's upset over her grandfather, currently sitting in a lockup at the police station. Then Charlotte confronts Peter. She tells him that the day Mads disappeared, Helga's shift ended right before that disappearance happened. Peter thinks she's crazy for suspecting Helga. This differs from the prime world where by this point Peter had already been exposed to Claudia, time travel, so he knew what was going on and anytime Charlotte questioned him he got very suspicious and nervous but here he just thinks she's crazy. Charlotte asks what the penny means, the penny she found in the bunker, and then says Ulrich is right. It's all connected. At the mention of Ulrich, Peter visibly gets upset. He probably suspects the affair that's going on between Charlotte and Ulrich, and then Charlotte leaves. Jumping over to the prime world, 2053, Claudia is burying her daughter, Regina. I have to say I wasn't too emotionally affected by this scene, partially because I think we only briefly see Claudia's face in her reaction to all this. That kind of lulled me into a false sense of, I wonder if Dark has a problem, where we never care too much when a character is killed because it all takes place within this crazy time travel scenario, and you're never sure whether or not to buy into the permanence of someone's death. So I got lulled into this false sense of security, and I was very wrong about that, because like I said, this became one of the most difficult episodes of Dark to watch. Claudia returns to home base from burying her daughter and finds another Claudia waiting for her, the Claudia from the alternate world who we haven't met yet. This other Claudia tells Claudia Prime that there are two groups fighting for time travel supremacy. She is here to guide our Claudia to the light side to join Eve's side. She warns Claudia that you can't trust Jonas. He wants to obliterate both worlds and destroy the knot, which sounds a lot like Adam. She says that Jonas doesn't know it yet, but his path will lead him to that end. Essentially, his path will lead him to becoming Adam versus Eve, who wants to save both worlds. Our Claudia tells other Claudia, but Jonas said we'll change one small thing and save the world. 
Other Claudia says that's what you told him. Your older self told him that in a positive feedback loop. Speaking of feedback loops, she then goes on to tell Claudia the big plan. So she gives some background, and this one's a little bit complicated, so I'm going to try and make it clear, at least based on my understanding of it. But she explains that three events occurred. In 1986, the tunnels were first opened. The portal was first opened under the nuclear plant. In 2019, older Jonas shut it down, and in 2020, younger Jonas opened it back up. In each of those three events, some cesium is left behind, which is a component of the black matter. When you want to trigger one of these events, when you want to open or close the tunnels, you need some cesium. And over time, cesium tends to break down. So in every one of these cycles, in every one of these time loops, Jonas or someone is taking some cesium before it's fully decayed and then triggering an event. Afterwards, you produce more cesium. That begins to decay. So let's say in 1986, you open the portal. That creates some cesium. It begins to decay. Then in 2019, you use what little cesium you have left to close the portal. That event creates more cesium, begins to decay, and then eventually you can use it to reopen the portal in 2020. That happens infinitely on a loop. Cesium decays, is used, you get more, etc. So this is all happening again over and over in that infinite time loop. And then Claudia says, other Claudia says, we need to preserve the knot. We need to ensure that these events continue to happen over and over. Other Claudia hands our Claudia the Triketra notebook, and we can see it's in much better condition than we typically seen it. And recently we saw the Lipscard man writing in that notebook. So I think it's the recently authored version of the notebook, and this is where it's really coming into play. Other Claudia tells Claudia Prime that Adam can never be allowed to untie the knot. You, Claudia, need to lead them, Jonas, Noah, and Elizabeth, down the same path again and again in order to preserve that knot. Alternate Claudia will do the same in her alternate world. Before she parts, she tells our Claudia that everything she needs to know is in that notebook, we'll meet again, and she says you'll have to lead Jonas and then later defy him. Basically saying you need to lead Jonas to the point where he turns into Adam and then turn your back on him. So I think we're getting to the idea that there's no way to quote unquote save everyone. All of these people, all of these family trees only exist because of this time knot. Because of all the crazy time travel, these families have come into existence. So you can really choose only between two worlds. One that has the knot and all these friends and families exist, or one where you've gotten rid of the knot. So I think Claudia here is saying, we've got to preserve these knots so all of us can continue to exist. And maybe there is no in-between where everyone gets to exist in a happy world. You get the unhappy, dark, not world, or none of them exist. And as an aside, if they don't sell a copy of this notebook as fan merchandise, that is a total missed opportunity. Jumping back in time to 1987, Charlotte as a child comes home to the clock shop where she sees her grandfather, H.G. Townhouse, and Charlotte is in a bad mood. She asks Townhouse if he thinks it's possible to go back in time. I'm assuming this is a reaction to the conversation she had with Jonas. If you recall, back in season one, Jonas goes back in time to stop Mikkel from ending his own life. When he arrives in 1986, he bumps into a young Charlotte. When she asks what he's doing there, Jonas says he's bringing someone back from the dead and alludes to time travel. Then Townhouse says, you're old enough, and clearly he's decided that it is the time to reveal some truth to Charlotte. If you recall, Charlotte will often refer to Townhouse as her grandfather, but clearly say that Townhouse is not her biological grandfather. So in this scene, we finally learn how Townhouse came to take care of Charlotte. He shows her a photo of a couple holding a baby. In the photo, we see Townhouse's son with his son's wife and their daughter. All three of them died in a car accident. But the night it happened, Townhouse heard a noise in his garage and saw two peculiar looking women there who had Charlotte with them as a baby. They give the baby over to Townhouse and say, everything will be taken from you tonight, but at the same time, you will be given everything. They also, along with the baby Charlotte, give him the four Charlotte pocket watch. And Townhouse adds, 
They found his son and his son's wife's bodies, but they never found the body of his granddaughter. Charlotte demands to know who her parents are, and Townhouse admits that he doesn't know. Now, at first, when Townhouse says that the body of his granddaughter was never found, I assume, well, wait a minute. Maybe Charlotte truly is your biological granddaughter. A couple of time travels rescued her from the car crash and then brought her to you that night. However, in the photo, we can clearly see it is not Elizabeth and Noah in that photo, Charlotte's biological parents. So, who is Townhouse's granddaughter? Whoever she is, I'm assuming she did not perish in that car crash, and she plays an important role. Now, as to who were the two women that appeared in his garage, my suspicion is that it's Elizabeth and Charlotte. At the end of the episode, or later in the episode, we see Charlotte and Elizabeth suit up with their radioactive gear in 2053 and then walk out to the God Particle. So we know they're traveling somewhere, and if they arrived in Townhouse's garage wearing their containment suits, that would make them look peculiar. Also, we know that Townhouse has handed over the Four Charlotte pocket watch which, as far as we know, Elizabeth is currently in possession of it. So if she travels back in time from 2053, she could hand over that pocket watch. Then Charlotte, unhappy after her conversation with her grandfather, goes to sit at the bus stop. I assume she's sitting there contemplating whether or not she should run away from home. While she's there, she bumps into a young Peter who is new in town. And by the way, great casting for the young Peter. Not just the physical resemblance, but even just his facial expressions were so similar to adult Peter that before they even said it, I knew that was Peter Doppler right away. The two of them begin to connect over the complexities of life as they both commiserate over their various situations, and Peter reveals that his mother recently died. Before she died, she revealed to him who his father is and that his father lives in Winden. That's why he's in town. Later in the episode, we see Peter in the middle of the night find the Doppler residence. And I'm very curious to see how this plays out because supposedly Peter's father is Helga. We've never really seen Helga in any other mode than working under Noah's thumb as a henchman, or we've seen him suffering from dementia as an old man. What is that person like as a father, and what does a personal relation look like between him and his son? I really have no idea, so I can't wait to see how that plays out. Staying in 1987, staying on the prime world, let's check in on Katarina. She goes to visit Ulrich in the institution and hatches a scheme to break him out that night. And she promises him that she will get Mikkel out of there. Ulrich apologizes for everything, saying to her, I'm sorry for everything. And that's the moment I start to really get worried. Because Ulrich at least gets a small amount of reconciliation. And any time in a movie or a television series when a character gets some kind of a conclusion or reconciliation, I start to worry that tragedy is afoot. Though I did not at all predict the tragedy that we were going to get. Then Katarina begins what, in my estimation anyway, is the worst plan ever to break Ulrich out of this institution. It basically boils down to her stalking her mother, Helena Albers, in the woods. Helena, if you recall Katarina's mother, she works at the institution and has a key card which Katarina will need to get Ulrich out of there. So she confronts her mother and takes out a knife, demands the key card. They struggle, during which Katarina yells at her and calls her mom. This freaks out Helena because a grown woman is calling her her mother. So Helena runs and she can clearly tell something unnatural is happening here. Eventually, Katarina hits Helena over the head with a rock, knocks her out, and then starts to dig through her mother's purse. While she does this, she makes the classic mistake of not checking behind her to make sure that this person is truly unconscious. Helena beats Katarina over the head with a rock, says, the devil sent you, you're not real. And we get to one of those brutal, hard to watch moments of the episode. Katarina gets her head smashed in over and over. And as Katarina dies, we see her hand uncurl. She is holding the St. Christopher medal, which 65 years later, Jonas and Marta will find in that 
very spot buried in the sand. Helena fills Katarina's backpack with rocks and drags her into the water. So what a brutal end to Katarina's story. It's especially brutal because of how quiet a death it is and how out of nowhere it felt. We watched Katarina's journey last season and all this buildup to her traveling back in time, trying to get her husband out of the institution, all for it to just end in this super brutal moment. I will also say I really wish that this shot wasn't in the trailer because as soon as I saw that Katarina's mother was wearing that red coat, I knew that Katarina was going to die. Meanwhile, Mikkel and Ines return home and inside, Mikkel notices a crack in the window. I'm assuming that's from where Katarina must have broken in to the home. That probably makes him think of Ulrich, and if there is any more to Ulrich's story, at this point, I've got to assume that it's going to involve Mikkel, maybe visiting Ulrich in the institution, or taking a stab himself at trying to break Ulrich out of there. Helena returns home to a young Katarina after murdering the old Katarina and does the thing that people always do in movies after they kill someone. She starts to manically scrub her hands trying to get rid of the blood on her body. Then she looks at young Katarina and notices I think a hickey on her neck and starts to beat up her daughter and in another hard to watch moment says I should have gotten rid of you too. This is an allusion to the previous episode where Hannah bumped into a young Helena Albers at the abortion clinic. Dark has oftentimes alluded to child abuse. For example, we've seen the cigarette burns on Trant's arms, but I think this is the first time we've seen it this up close and visceral. It was really difficult to watch Helena beating Katarina, especially after we just watched her kill Katarina as an adult. Very tragic to watch all this, to see a young Katarina suffering, to at the same time know how it all ends for her, was just awfully tragic. Later when the montage begins, we see Ulrich waiting in the institution, where of course Katarina doesn't show, and we see the St. Christopher medal in the dark, in the sand, just sitting there waiting to be discovered decades later. So, yeah, pretty sad episode overall. Fast forward to 2020, still on the Prime world, we see Elizabeth and Peter going back to the containment site where they have their daily routine of seeing if Francisca or Charlotte have been found. However, this time Elizabeth refuses. She says that her mom and sister are dead. She doesn't want to do this anymore. This was the most difficult storyline in the episode to watch, starting with the rift between Peter and Elizabeth. It's pretty devastating to see the degradation of their relationship, especially when, thanks to Noah's line a couple of episodes ago, we know that Peter doesn't have long to live. Elizabeth returns to the trailer alone and finds a strange man in there stealing their food. He smashes Elizabeth's head against the wall, knocks her unconscious, and she gets a bad cut above her eye, so I'm thinking this may be how her eye gets damaged, as we know it does from seeing her in 2053. Then the man ties her up. He keeps talking to her. She, of course, can't answer. Once he is satisfied with his food, he starts to sort of pet Elizabeth, and this is where the episode gets really hard to watch. He starts to force himself on Elizabeth. Then Peter shows up and pulls the man off her, this begins a struggle between Peter, the man, and Elizabeth. During this struggle, there's no score, there's no music, just the pure brutality of what's going on. Eventually, the man overpowers Peter and slowly sinks a knife into his throat. Then Elizabeth brutally kills the man, bashing his head in over and over. And wow, probably the bleakest scene we've ever seen on Dark. We've seen many deaths, but I don't think I've ever felt one as viscerally as I felt this one because of how drawn out it was and because, like I said before, there's no score. All you hear are the grunts and shouts between these people, and when Peter dies, we are right in his face as he goes from struggle to the realization that he is dying. 
It felt like something out of a Cormac McCarthy novel. And it is hard to watch, but I think we needed it to understand how Elizabeth goes from the young girl we see here, how she goes from that to the hardened Elizabeth that we meet in the 2050s. And now with Peter dead and nowhere else to go, Elizabeth heads to the cave where Noah finds her. We of course know that over time, Elizabeth and Noah will form a relationship and eventually birth a child who will grow up to be Charlotte. By the way, before we continue, just wanted to quickly chime in to remind you, if you're enjoying this video, to please go ahead and hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, and of course the bell icon so you get notified the next time we do a video or the next time we go live. Back to the show. Fast forward 33 years to 2053, we see Charlotte and Adam meeting in a forest. Adam asks, have you made up your mind? Just one more day and we can untie this knot once and for all. But you must, as all of us, do your part. Charlotte asks, will you see it through? And Adam says, Eve will never achieve her goal. Her world doesn't deserve to be saved any more than ours does. It's always interesting to see two characters interact for the first time. We've never seen Charlotte and Adam talk before, so even though brief, pretty interesting to see it here. And whatever Adam is talking about, first, I'm sure it's some form of manipulation. And I couldn't help but notice that he keeps changing his verbiage. Sometimes he says, we have to destroy the knot. And here he says, we have to untie the knot. Which, I have to say, sounds a lot nicer than destroy. And I think that's part of the manipulation. Now, Adam asks Charlotte, have you made up your mind? So, it appears that Charlotte has some decision that she's struggling over. Whether or not to do something that Adam is asking. What is Adam asking of her? Because it's a difficult decision, I have to assume it involves some form of sacrifice. Probably the death of someone close to her. Maybe she has to kill Elizabeth. It's hard to imagine logistically why that would have to happen, but when I think about a difficult decision for Charlotte to make, that is the first thing that comes to mind. Later, we see Elizabeth, Charlotte, Francisca, and Adam at the nuclear site looking at the God Particle. They all hug goodbye, which is very reminiscent of the scene last episode where Silja and Agnes hug goodbye before Agnes leaves. Then Adam says, it's time, you have to let her go, Francisca. Charlotte and Elizabeth then get in their containment suits and head out to the God Particle. Now, the way that characters keep saying goodbye before leaving into the God Particle, first Agnes, now Charlotte and Elizabeth, makes me think that they're heading to various points in the time stream to enact Adam's plan, which will destroy the knot. The reason it's such a difficult goodbye is because if you destroy the knot, I have to assume that means at least this iteration of all of these people will cease to exist. So that means that Charlotte in this scene is saying goodbye to her daughter Francisca for the last time. Also, as an aside, it's hard to ignore the fact that Francisca doesn't speak at all in these scenes. Not just this one, but I don't think we've seen her speak in the 2053 timeline at all. It's always Magnus doing the talking. So it makes me wonder if this is Francisca from the alternate world, the one who is mute. In the previous episode, I was wondering why Agnes and Silja had such a tearful goodbye before Agnes went into the God Particle. What was the relationship between the two of them? Well, looking back at episode two and freezing frame on a certain scene where Eve shows Jonas a very detailed family tree, I think I found the answer to that. Now, I will reveal it at the end of this video because although it's not a spoiler, I got it from a previous episode, I am assuming that the show will more blatantly give us the revelation in a later episode. So if you'd rather wait for that, I'll give you the chance to avoid the revelation now and instead talk about it at the end of this video. For now, let's go back to the alternate world in 2019 where we see Jonas and Marta one day before the apocalypse. Jonas has a nightmare where he's woken up by Marta slowly putting her fingers on his shoulder, similar to a nightmare he's had previously where Mikkel wakes him up. Then Jonas wakes up in bed next to alt-world Marta. Downstairs, Katarina is freaking out because she didn't know where Marta was all day yesterday, and she sees this strange guy with her that has a neck scar, 
but Marta and Jonas leave her. They leave the house. Jonas and Marta arrive at the power plant. They're there to prevent the barrels from being opening and avert the apocalypse. They go through the fence, but as they do that, Marta gets a scratch on her face. Jonah notices that the scratch is the same one he saw on the time-traveling Marta that brought him to the alternate world to begin with. That makes him realize that all the pieces are falling into place and everything they're doing is leading to the same outcome, which means Eve lied to him. Whatever they're doing here, maybe that's what triggers the apocalypse in the first place. Marta asks Jonas why, and Jonas says, because they're all lying. And then he insists that they need to go back to Eve and confront her to demand the truth. Now, I loved seeing Jonas finally learn not to trust anyone. It was very satisfying to hear him yell, they're all lying. But there's also this foreboding sense of inevitable awfulness in his future. Because how do you compete against someone that's already been through all this? Every time we think Jonas has figured something out and he's doing the right thing, it feels like we get the twist that no, actually this was all part of the plan anyway. So it was great to see this, but at the same time, like I said, gave me this sense of something bad is coming, though I had no idea how bad it was going to be. On the walk back to the cave, Marta asks Jonas, what do we do if you really can only choose one world? Then when Jonas doesn't say anything, Marta realizes that Jonas already decided a while ago what he needs to do. Jonas needs to go back to his world. He tells Marta that it's wrong for them to be together. It's wrong for him to be here. And then Jonas says the wrong thing. He says, I didn't want any of this. Marta says, last night, you didn't want that. Then she kisses him and tries to prove otherwise. But as always, when backed into a corner in tough situations, Jonas basically says nothing. Then they continue on their journey into the cave. I found everything in this episode between Jonas and Marta to be pretty emotionally draining. It's such a strange feeling that only this show could pull off. On the one hand, you have the short-lived joy of Jonas and Marta being reunited and being together, but that's clouded by the wrongness of Jonas being from another world and knowing that there is a dead Marta back on that world. Also, somehow they managed to drench everything in this episode with a sense of dread. I think artistically, it made a lot of sense to show Peter and Katarina die earlier in the episode because by the time we get back to Jonas, we now have this real sense of danger. Main characters that we've been following for a long time are meeting brutal ends. So when we see Jonas, we get worried. Jonas and Marta arrive at Eve's lair. Jonas demands to go back to his world, but Eve says there's no way for him to go back and then repeats something Adam once said to Jonas. A human being lives three lives. The first one ends with the loss of naivete, the second with the loss of innocence, and the third with the loss of life itself. By the way, these similarities between Eve and Adam, where they'll say some of the same things, makes me wonder if Adam and Eve are not really competing against one another, but what if that whole rift between them is a fake and actually they're working together? Anyway, Eve says the third ends with the loss of life itself, and then her next line is yours ends here and now. Then middle-aged Marta walks in. Eve says, you've accomplished what you were sent here for. Marta says, we haven't accomplished anything. Middle-aged Marta butts in and says, you'll understand when it's time. Then time-traveling Marta, the one that ditched Jonas in 1888, walks in, says sorry, and then shoots Jonas. He dies in Marta's arms just like Marta died in his, back on his world. As Jonas dies, he hands her the St. Christopher necklace. Then Marta promises to make things right just like Jonas did previously. And wow, as much as I had a sense of dread throughout this episode, I definitely did not see this coming. This was an insane episode on the level of a red wedding from Game of Thrones, for example. And of course, it makes no sense. How can Jonas be dead if older Jonas is still alive? If Adam is still alive? And why doesn't older Jonas remember any of this? I have a couple of theories. 
One, maybe the Jonas that died here isn't really our Jonas. There was a kind of weird situation last season that it was easy for us to gloss over and just move on from. But after Jonas went back in time to try and prevent Mikel's suicide, he left with older Claudia. The next time we saw him, a year had passed. And he casually mentions that for the last year, he's been studying time travel with Claudia. But what if the Jonas that returned wasn't our Jonas? This show is very into the idea of threes. The Triketra, past, present, future, 33-year cycles. We've seen two worlds. What if there is a third world and there are two Jonases at play? There's the alternate world that doesn't have a Jonas. There's the Jonas from our world that grows up into older Jonas. And then there's a Jonas from this mysterious third world that dies here in Marta's arms. It sounds a little crazy, but I wouldn't put it past this show. My other theory is one I've talked about previously, which is that the timeline essentially resets at the end of each cycle. You have young Jonas that grows up into older Jonas by following a certain sequence of events. Younger Jonas can deviate from that path, even die, for example, while older Jonas continues to exist. However, eventually, the timeline sort of resets to the latest status quo, and this older Jonas will have to disappear as time realigns itself with the new course of events. Meaning, younger Jonas no longer grows up into older Jonas, but instead dies. So the two, young Jonas and older Jonas, can temporarily coexist until that cycle reset happens. So we'll see if either of those turn out to be true. My guess is neither of them are right, and it's something I just don't see coming at all. By the way, I also just wanted to say how striking an image it was to see Jonas lying there dead on top of the family tree. First off, it just feels poetic that his death would occur on top of the family tree, which all sprouted from him. In fact, he's lying in the spot where he would appropriately belong on that family tree. Second, the two halves of the tree almost look like wings as he lies there. So just a very interesting image and one that will stick with me long after this show concludes. And that's where the episode ends. Like I said, great episode, but man, that was a tough episode to get through. One of the most bleak and brutal episodes of Dark we've ever seen. I'm glad that I'm pacing myself because this would be a pretty emotionally draining experience if you were to watch all the episodes at once. Having said that, I really need to go watch the next episode to see what happens next, and I am going to go do that. But of course, as soon as I wrap up that episode, I'll come back here and record Record the next review. So if you haven't done so already, make sure to hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, and of course hit the bell icon so you get notified when the next review is up. Also, my goal is to finish watching the season sometime tomorrow. So tomorrow night, Friday evening, we can do a live stream and talk about the final episode, talk about the season as a whole, and just try to unpack everything we saw so you'll definitely want to make sure you're subscribed before then so you get notified when we go live and you can be part of that conversation and i almost forgot to talk about agnes and silja so here is where we'll get into what can be learned by looking at eve's family tree so i said i was wondering why agnes and silja had such a tearful goodbye what is the relationship between the two of them first who is silja well, we know that Hannah is pregnant with Egon's child, and if you look at the family tree, it looks like Hannah's daughter will turn out to be Silja, who grows up to become Elizabeth's translator in the post-apocalyptic world. Now, what is Silja's connection to Agnes? Well, one of the mysteries on this show has been, we know Agnes and Noah are brother and sister. Well, who are their parents? Again, if you look at the family tree, it appears that Bartosh and Silja will get together and have two children. That's right, Noah and Agnes. That means when Agnes was saying goodbye to Silja, she was saying goodbye to her own mother. By the way, that opens the door to another mystery. In all these 2050s scenes, I've been wondering where is Bartosh? We don't exactly have an answer to that yet, but we at least can see that he must have some presence there because at some point he's going to have children with Silja. So, wow, that is an awesome little twist. And I love the fact that Dark 
reveals it to us in the background if you're paying attention, if you pause, if you scope through it. And those are the best twists, the ones that don't feel like a cheat, the ones where when you look back, you can see the breadcrumbs and you can see the seeds were planted. Otherwise, the twist comes out of nowhere and it feels like a cheat. Dark has never done that. And it's one of the many reasons I love this show and will dearly miss it when it's gone. Anyway, thanks for watching and see you on the next One Take.